Wilson Hart. Uh, she is the CEO of the Gresham's Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome all of you to uh, the luncheon series for the League of Women Voters, and this is our lead program for today. Now to let her take it away from here. Hello, well thank you first of all for inviting me um, to speak at the League. Again, I'm Allison Hart, I'm the CEO of the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce, and I've been the CEO for um, over two years, since January of 2011 when I started at the Chamber. And what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit big picture about what the Chamber does, but then I'm going to really go into detail about what we're doing on the government affairs level because I know that's all of your interest. So that's um, the bigger picture of what I'm going to talk about. So the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce was established in 1933, and um, we're a private nonprofit business association. We promote businesses and the community, um, and we were listed in 2012 on, on the 100 best nonprofits to work for in Oregon. So that was one of our kudos for the year. So that was kind of exciting. Our mission is bringing together and serving the business community, and our vision is to do that through promoting the community connecting business and people, advancing a vibrant and prosperous local economy, and representing business to government. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do under each of those four pillars, which is kind of how we look at it. It's the pillars of our, our organization or the core of what we do. But I'm really going to get in detail I, into the piece about how we represent business to government. On the level of promoting the community, we are a visitor center as well. So we serve the East County region as a visitor center. We're open um, you know, during the week for anyone who wants to come in and get information about the region. Um, we have a visitor guide that we put together. And we also produce a map of the region. And this is of the whole East County region. We're the only ones who actually have this put together. Our directory won an award uh, in 2012 for, uh, from the Oregon State Chamber of Commerce for best directory in mid-sized chambers in the state. So we have worked hard on that. And this has all of our members' information, business directory, but it also includes information about events in the region and that sort of thing. Because we do work to promote bringing people to um, the East County region. And I do say the East County region because we do cover Gresham, Fairview, um, Wood Village, Troutdale. We have members in Boring as well as Damascus. Um, so we do a broad area. There's members in East Portland as well. So we, we do serve the whole area. We have a lot of partnerships with groups, do a lot of collaboration, um, which we need to do as a chamber because we are a resource for the region. We get all kinds of calls about a whole variety of things. Um, you know, we work with groups such as the Rockwood Business Coalition, the Historic Downtown Gresham Business Association with East Metro Economic Alliance, um, and then groups such as those who put on the Art Walk um, or someone like Mount Hood Aquatic Center who would be bringing a lot of people into the region, whether that's visitors. There's a lot that Mount Hood Aquatic Center does to bring visitors to the region through their swim meets and the activities that they do at the pool, which some people don't even know, but it's a great, a great partnership. Some other ways that we promote our community are kind of in the bigger picture from an educational level. Um, once a year, we do an economic summit where we spend a half day talking about what's happening on an economic level um, in the region, um, what things have happened during the year, what things are coming down the pike that are going to impact business, and you know what we need to do about it. How do we work on workforce development and that type of thing? That's what the economic summit is about. And that's in October, the first Thursday of October every year. We also have, at the end of the year, a Business Excellence Awards. Um, and it's our time um, throughout the year to acknowledge those of our businesses in the community that are just doing excellent work. And that's in December. Um, and we have uh, open for nominations, usually around October. Um, so look for that information, because if there's an excellent business that you want to nominate, you actually can. And um, so we'll put information about that. I did bring um, this information. I didn't know how many there would be uh, here, but if any of you want any of these handouts afterwards, I'm happy to, to pass them out to you. Um, another thing we do is uh, to connect business and people. And um, we have over 100 opportunities throughout the year for people to do that, whether it's through our Friday AMs, which a lot of people know the chamber as, where you go for Friday to do your, your have your coffee and connect with people and what have you. And that is a very strong program for us, but it's only one of the very many things that we do. Um, and uh, we also have networking opportunities through our Biz Booster Lunch, which is once a month. It's actually right now. as we 
we speak, where we members get together casually, get to know each other a little bit bigger in a little bit deeper way. We really promote that because you can go to something and network and meet somebody, but you're not going to ask them for business right in that moment. And really, business people do business with people they know and like. So what we really encourage is that our members get to know the other people in the community. And so we make as many opportunities available to make that happen. Um, we also do ribbon cuttings for new businesses or businesses in new locations. It's always an exciting thing because typically if it's a new business, it means that there's been job creation. They've brought something new to our region, um, which is enhancing the economic development of, of the area. And job creation is really important because if people are working in Gresham, they're um, usually spending their money here too. And, and that's where I'm going to move on to. Um, I'll talk a little bit about in, um, our Trilocal First program in a bit. We also do a Chamber Expo uh, twice a year, once in May and once in November, and this is where we showcase both our new members, but some of our existing members also have a tabletop where they talk about what they do. We also have community groups which come and participate in that uh, to get information out. We have education for businesses small and large alike. Um, we have a program called Chamber Tuesdays where every Tuesday from 11.30 to 1, there's something going on through the chamber. And so that may be a luncheon like our government affairs forum, which I'll talk about in a minute, or um, our Learn at Lunch program, which is typically a topic that is helpful to grow business. Um, the Learn at Lunch uh, coming up is how to outsmart your smartphone, and who doesn't need that? You know, even I am like, wow, I always just have to ask my 14-year-old daughter, what is this and how do you get here? You know, and so this is a way for us to help pe business people move along. And our topics this uh, year are all around technology, whether it's um, uh, SEO or search engine marketing or working with Facebook to promote your business or working with YouTube. So they're all things that can help enhance exposure for businesses or just help them out, like with your smartphone. Um, other things um, that we do that um, I alluded to before are working on economic development. And that's like a big word, and it could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. One of my staff always tells me, Allison, you're talking at the 30,000 foot level. Talk to people so they know what you mean. So economic development is really about bringing prosperity to the region so that businesses are thriving, people are settling here, they're spending their money in the community. And so that happens in a number of ways, and we participate in a number of different ways. One of the things I alluded to before was through our Tri-Local First um, Committee, and this is a committee that is charged with educating our community about the impact of spending your dollars locally. And that is actually a really important thing because more money that's spent in the economy when it's spent local circulates locally and it actually creates jobs and so we have a whole committee and their purpose is to educate people about that and then we have some just one program running right now through the Tri Local First and it's our charms program and um, we actually I would like to take credit but you know chambers are notorious for copying other chambers for their programs that work and it's all well known and supported within the industry but we took on this charms program and the idea is that retail businesses could get a charm and then the chamber has charm bracelets so you come in and get a charm bracelet and then you go around to local businesses and get a charm. We have over 100 businesses participating, which is great because those people who are seeking out charms then are going into the door of all these local businesses. And some of them, it's the first time they've ever been there. So the idea was to get more exposure for spending money locally. And that's why it happens through our Tri-Local First um, Committee. So that's on like the, the kind of the on the street level and what I call Main Street um, level of economic development. But there's also the bigger picture when you think about the developable land that's available in the East County area. And that's when we would look at industrial recruitment. Now, the chamber isn't currently doing any industrial recruitment. That really takes place through the city of Gresham. However, as well as Fairview and Troutdale and to a certain extent um, Wood Village, but they don't have a lot of developable land. But what we do is we partner with them to help them along. If there's a business person, perhaps perhaps looking to expand their business here, we might they might say, well, we'd like to meet a CEO or a leader of another business in the area. Can you connect us? And we would help with that. We might go on a site visit and help with the site visit. We also participate, mostly me, through staff of um, on um, 
looking at what's coming down the pike and partnering with organizations such as the Port of Portland. They currently own two of the largest plots of developable land in the East County area. And so we work with them um, in any way that we can help them. And I sit on a couple of different economic development advisory committees, um, which are looking at the bigger picture of what's needed in the region. What do we need to do to enhance our marketing to bring bigger companies here? The other part of that, which I'll get into, is the advocacy piece and how you make it so that it's easy for people to come here. That's really, really important. And that's part of why the chamber has really changed in the last couple of years to step into advocacy. Um, we also work on um, education and workforce development. And that's from kindergarten up through you know, the college level. And you may be wondering, well, how does that work with education, uh, with, with um, economic development? It's actually very important because one of the things that large companies are looking for when they settle here is do we have the workforce to support what their needs are? And so we need a trained and educated workforce to meet those needs. And so therefore, it's very important that we keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening uh, in our community in terms of education. And it starts, I mean, it really starts at the elementary level and goes all the way up. And you know, there's a big push right now um, for career and technical training and for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. There's a big push for that because for many of the manufacturing companies in the country, a lot of their workforce is going to be retiring in the next 10 years. And so they need people to fill those slots. So we really need to be on top of what's happening with workforce training. It's very, very important. And that's the other reason why we look at the advocacy piece, because that goes into the education, to educational system, which we all know has some things that are not working very well. And so we need to look at how do we fix that? You know, and how does business partner with government to do that? Um, a lot of what we do is relationship building with the key regional stakeholders that are working on economic development. And that's probably the biggest piece of my job, is keeping in touch with people, meeting regularly with people who are working on economic development so that I can help in any way that I can, but also to make sure that we're speaking the regional voice for the whole region, not just for Gresham, but all of the, all of the jurisdictions in our area. Because if a large company settles here, it's gonna help everybody. And so that's our interest, is to have a large company come here. Um, for everyone's good. So I've alluded to uh, that the chamber has made some changes in terms of our advocacy over the last couple of years. When I came to the chamber, we weren't currently taking an active role in advocacy, meaning being a, a voice to of business to government or working um, with the government to uh, say this is good for business or this isn't good or taking a stand on issues. So over the last two years, we have revamped um, our government affairs program to include those elements. Um, our goal with our advocacy is to provide education and awareness first and foremost to the community about things that are coming down the pike. And I actually have a list of things that we're watching right now. Um, not all of them have we taken a stand on, but we're watching them and sending out information to our chamber community because there are things that are in the legislature right now that could have impact to business. And we want to make sure that businesses are aware of that. So um, we, we advocate for members on a local, regional, state, and federal level on things that could impact economic vitality um, because we're wanting this to be a very thriving community. Um, we adopted a new policy in 2012 to actually take stand on issues. Um, Marlene had asked me if we're actually doing any endorsement of candidates. That will be our goal for 2013, that we will create a policy and a procedure for candidate endorsement. So my guess is that will be done by the end of this year, and by 2014 we would be doing candidate endorsement. It's a very important part of what happens in our region, because if you are focused towards making a prosperous and thriving region, it's really important that you have business-friendly candidates on the city council, in the state legislature, and all around. And in many communities, the chamber takes a very active part in that. And so that's something that we're going to be growing over the next several years. We have a newly appointed committee for our government affairs um, council. And I actually brought a list to give all of you, which I'll hand out <coughs> in the end. Um, and we are looking at all kinds of issues or topics, um, government regulation, education, land use and environment, transportation, economic development, jobs creation. That's what we mainly focus on, um, but there are others that come to our attention as well. 
And I mean, to put it in the big perspective, when the legislative season started this year, 3,000 bills were dropped. You know, there's no way that one entity can monitor all 3,000 bills. So we have said, okay, these are like the top six things which we think are important. And so we're looking at legislation in those areas. And, and at times we may con contact a specific member and say, hey, this is legislation that's really important to you right now. Would you be interested in testifying for or against it? You know, and there may, it's the kind of thing like we're a conduit to connect that. Um, also, um, through our program, we do education, um, both through sending out emails regarding what's happening on certain bills, but we also have our government affairs forum, um, which happens the fourth Tuesday of every month. I've brought the upcoming topics for you. And those are really to engage our members and other people can come as well um, to understand what the issues are that are coming up in our region. And just for an example, um, this month we're um, having a couple of the superintendents from the area to talk about the state of education. Um, you may have heard that the Gresham Barlow School District is actually going to drop a construction bond on the November ballot. And so, you know, it's very important for us to understand what is the impact on business and what is the impact on the community to vote for or against that very specific thing, which would help um, to maintain the school buildings and such. It's specifically a construction bond to help grow the school. So you'll hear more about that coming down the line. Our our April topic is on the, the Metro tax levy. They have a levy on the ballot for May. So we'll have a pro and con presenter um, for that, talking about the reasons to do it and perhaps the disadvantages, advantages, disadvantages. We try to really represent a, um, a balanced program so people can hear both sides. And for example, last year, when I'm forgetting what the ballot measure was, but when there was the districting measure um, on the ballot for the city of Gresham, um, we did a program which was a pro and con. So we had a presenter from both sides of the issue. And on that particular issue, we did take a stand um, and, and felt that it wasn't advantageous for the community to go into districting. Um, you know, some of them we just do education and some of them the chamber will actually take a stand and make a statement about an issue. Other things coming up, in May we have a forum on what healthcare reform means to your business or to you. Um, it's really important with all the changes that are happening. We have a lot of healthcare members, but we have a lot of business members that as the whole healthcare reform package happens, it will impact their business. And so we wanna do the best that we can to make sure that businesses are educated and know what's happening. Um, we have a tentative topic for June, so I'm going to skip that, but July um, we will do a legislative review. We'll have all six of our legislators here. We have four representatives and two senators, um, and they'll talk about what was accomplished in the legislative season this year. And so for us, again, that's a, a moment for us to see, well, how'd you do? You know, was it business friendly? Did you track some of the things that we're tracking as well and favorably vote for them? So that's what we're, we're working towards. Um, the other thing that I participate in is through um, the Chamber of Commerce, we are a member of the Oregon State Chamber of Commerce. Um, anytime you see, like uh, uh, Marlene asked me this about the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Gresham Mary Chamber of Commerce is not a member of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It is a membership organization, just like we're a membership organization. And we don't choose to be a member of that organization. We um, tend to work more locally in terms of working with the State Chamber and also the Western Association of Chamber Executives. Um, some of the benefits we get from that are for professional development for myself and my staff, but through the Oregon State Chamber, we we also have an avenue for advocacy because they work on advocacy issues and so they keep me informed about the things that are coming down the pike and I actually sit on the board of the Oregon State Chamber of Commerce so um, they have a legislative committee that's tracking bills um, tracks the ones that are have can have a huge impact to business and I get a weekly email about what's happening and there's also a weekly conference call that I sit in on to understand what the issues are that are coming down the pike and like I said, with 3,000 bills, you need someone to help you sort that out. I also track emails through the uh, Associated in Oregon Industries and the Oregon Business Association to help me to know what's happening um, on a business level, just to get a balanced view and not just have information coming to me from one organization. Because as you know, it's just important to see all the different views. Um, we also have, as a form of our um, uh, 
education, we have an email called the Prosperity Project that we send out to our members and it has bill and issue tracking and that type of thing. Um, let's see, I wanted to tell you a couple things that we're tracking and this is pretty detailed so I'll try to keep it high level. Um, but on a land use level, there's a couple things that are in the legislature right now. There's an industrial site readiness bill. There's four of them, two in the House, two in the Senate. And I actually have these written down and I'll hand this out to you when I'm finished. Um, so that uh, to help spur growth in uh, the jurisdictions, because typically the, the aim of this um, particular uh, legislation is that right now how it stands, it's up to a specific jurisdiction or a city to entice a developer to come to the area, often at the cost of the city, where the city will make a lot of investments into the piece of property to get the land the, the developer to come. Well, what happens is most of the reward of that risk goes to the state through the revenues that come through income tax and uh, the taxes that come in. So what these bills are trying to do is to balance that out a little bit so that the jurisdiction isn't making all of the risk and the state getting all of the reward. Um, and so there's been a lot of studies that were done in the last year, and so there's four pieces of legislation on the table. The chamber is actually in support of these because for us, we have the most shovel-ready land available in the Portland metro area. So this could be a big boon for our area should some of this balance out. So it's very important um, legislation. Um, another thing that's coming up, this is also important to our members, there's a cap and trade bill in the Senate and it's a gas tax essentially. The only state in the country right now that has the same type of gas tax is California. Um, and there's currently, it's sunsetted right now and we'd like it to stay that way because if it goes away, what will happen is a huge expense to anybody who works in manufacturing or transportation, which a great deal of our traded sector companies in this region are traded, are manufacturing. And so it would so adversely affect them. And I have the bill names on here and I actually have information on all of them um, if you want to go deeper, but I don't know if you've ever read one of the legislative bills, but it's pretty dry, so I always go for the summary because it's a little bit much even for me. There's a couple of employment bills that we're following. There's one on a prevailing wage in enterprise zones. That would be difficult um, for a lot of businesses who are wanting to grow or do industrial development, so we've been watching that. Um, there's also a bill right now that's on regulations for staffing agencies that are so many regulations that it could be very detrimental to um, temp agencies or employment agencies or that type of thing. There's a sick leave bill that's happening in Portland and although that's not directly related to us, once if that whatever happens in Portland will probably go down the pike on the state level. So we kind of want to pay attention to what's happening there so that then if it's coming down to the state level um, that we can pay attention to figure out, okay, do we want to take a stand on this? How does this affect our business members and what have you? Um, there's also a workers' compensation bill um, which uh, allows compensation for all businesses including LLCs and that we're watching that one. It hasn't come up yet but it's on the table. One of the huge uh, things that's on the table right now, as you must have all heard, is PERS reform. PERS has a huge impact to our state. The system is out of balance, um, and if it's not fixed, it will cause a huge problem in our educational <laughs> system, which already has um, challenges. And so right now, um, last week, the budget was released. The governor pre presented his budget, and then the legislature presented their budget. He had a budget that had 89, I think $895 million in proposed PERS reform. The legislature had a budget that had, I think, $465 million in PERS reform. So there's a big disparity there. There's another bill on the table that's for more comprehensive PERS reform that we're watching very closely. Because right now, from what I'm hearing from the business organizations, you know, the way it stands, if some significant reform doesn't take place, it will be very detrimental to the state. So we need to watch this very closely, and this will push all of the budget conversations this, this legislative season. Um, lastly, I mentioned very briefly, there is on a local level, um, the Gresham Barlow School District is doing a construction bond and that will be on the November ballot. So we have done some educational programs, their superintendent has um, presented to my board of directors and we will be making a stand on that particular um, 
uh, issue on that's coming up in November. We thought it might be on the May one, so we were pretty prepared, but we'll wait uh, until closer to November. So those are just kind of some high-level things. I wanted to um, pause for questions. Um, Kathy, you said to leave some time, so. One of the questions about connecting with the regional, bringing business to our community, because we do have uh, the only area that doesn't have build out, mm -hmm. is that connected with, I think it's called Grove Portland or? Um, Greater Portland Inc. Greater, Greater right. Portland Inc. So how it works on the bigger level is, you know, really industrial recruitment happens on a statewide level because when we're competing for a company to, to settle here, we're competing not only on a state and nationwide level but internationally. That company may be looking at China, they may be looking at North Carolina, they may be looking in the Midwest, they may be looking here. So what it behooves us to do as a region is work with the larger regional organizations such as Greater Portland Inc. who works with the state uh, to get the, the industrial developers here in the first place and then look at everything that's available in the Portland metro, Portland metro area. And like I said, we have two of the largest plots of lands available. So working regionally means not only on that level of working with Greater Portland Inc. but also having all the four jurisdictions work together um, when a client does come to the table. And we are fortunate in this area that our economic development efforts are very closely aligned and in step um, with the four cities because all, everybody realizes that anybody who settles here is going to have a benefit for all four cities. And to answer your question. And East Metro Economic Alliance is a part of this. Right. All, all of this is right. connected, which is it, very it, good. It's all connected, and that's why, that's why we partner um, with everyone. I mean, we partner with East Metro Economic Alliance. I sit on a couple of their committees. I sit on their Workforce and Education Committee. I sit also on, I can't even remember the name of this committee, but it's the Alliance for Economic Development Committee that looks at kind of the bigger picture of how do we do this together. So we work very closely with East Metro Economic Alliance. They're an economic development advocacy organization, so they're really looking to grow. They don't go out and do the recruitment, they actually make sure that we're an environment that's that's good to come to. So it's, we have a very strong relationship with them. Thinking regional. Yes, exactly. And, and I would say we are a regional chamber, we think regionally. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about the four cities in Boring and Damascus, I'm also thinking about the Portland metro area, because we have to be partnering with the Portland metro area as well, in kind of the bigger sense and the bigger picture. Other questions? How's Portland to work with? You know, I think everyone knows that we, we are all working towards the same goal. Um, I think the same thing happens in the perception with Portland that actually happens with Gresham and the smaller cities here. It's like, oh, Portland is the big dog. You know, they're going to get everything they need for themselves, and we're not going to get what we need. You know, I don't go to the I don't go to the table with that type of conversation in mind. What I think about is, wow, how do we all work together to benefit our entire region? And so I'm just looking at the big picture all the time. And what's important is to have a voice at the table. And that's why it's, you have to be actively involved with all of the organizations that are, are working towards the same end. To answer your question. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, I'm the land use chair of a neighborhood organization. And although we don't have much developable land in our area, it's, we, don't, we have businesses that have gone out of business and we want to get some smaller businesses in. So mm -hmm. who would we contact regarding the land use issue, number one? Mm -hmm. And well, I, yeah, I guess that's the beginning. Work. I yeah. guess that's the beginning place. Yeah. It's, it's um, not always clear from the outside how this works, but bigger industrial recruitment goes through the economic development department in the cities in, in the area. When you're looking at uh, and that's for traded sector, which means companies that are producing things that are traded outside of our state, okay? Essentially, any product that brings in commerce from outside of state, not services, but actually products. When you're looking at what you're talking about, it's commercial. So that's commercial development. And there's a small business department at the city of Gresham that works with businesses um, that are on a commercial level. So it would be through the city of Gresham, if your neighborhood association is in Gresham, then it would be through the city of Gresham that you would do that. But it's not always clear, because some people think, well, it's business development, but really the economic development team is working on the big picture industrial development, because that's actually what brings revenue through taxes um, to the city. And because we have no sales tax in 
um, in this area. It's not that a commercial business isn't good, but the yield is so much higher when it's a large in industry coming to the area. And so that's where they focus. And there is the small business department um, at the city. Does that help? Surely. Um, has um, the, the tax abatement or tax forgiveness uh, to encourage businesses to come here, has that been successful or is it kind of mixed or what has been the result? The, the enterprise zones? <clears throat> Um, that's what it's called typically for the industrial development are the enterprise zones and those are in very specific areas. There has also been on the main street level a garage to storefront program and the garage to storefront program that the city did was very successful. And right now um, that, that program ended but they're looking at it for their budget year for the next year and I don't know what the status is on that because they're just starting their budgeting process for the city right now. Um, but there's two different types of tax abatement. Okay. Well, I guess I was thinking of, of the uh, larger companies where, you know, they were guaranteeing so many jobs um, for a consideration of uh, tax reduction. Am I correct in that or am I mistaken? Alex? No, that's what the enterprise zones do is they make a tax, um, it, it depends on the zone, but what it does is it makes it an incentive for businesses to settle here. And yes, that has worked, but industrial development is, is very complex, and sometimes it takes years to get a company to come here. You know, And so yes, it's effective, and it's a long-term process. And like I said, we're competing internationally, not just regionally, mm -hmm. um, for people to settle here. It's one of those things I don't really understand, though. We're, they're giving, giving away our taxes to these people, <laughs> and some of them are going out of business before they really complete what they say they're going to. You know, I don't know the exact regulations and specifics about how that works. In general, enterprise zones are a good thing because if you get the commerce here, it does build jobs through construction, it builds jobs through the employees that are here and the people who move here to live here. So I would say in a 30,000 foot view, it's a good thing. I don't know specifically of those who have gone out of business who have had that, that tax benefit. Because we've had, it seems like we've had quite a few in our area. Yeah, I wouldn't know specifically who those are. Any other questions? Kathy? A little more on education. I know you mentioned that you provide as much education to the community about the education issue and, and how the chamber works directly with that. Not only is business on an international level, but education is on an mm -hmm. international level, more global. And I, I, I think that we're just kind of really beginning for Oregonians to begin to perceive that. That it's not just our local school district or, you know, but it, it's so much more global. It's a hot topic all the way around. It, you know, there is. is the governor's initiative, the uh, 40, 40, 20 plan, I think, you know, that's, that's in every conversation that I go to around economic development, workforce development, that comes up. And, you know, from, everyone's perspective, we know that the funding is broken for education, but how do you fix it? And that's really the question. And that's why PERS reform is such a hot issue because right now, such a huge proportion of the budget goes to, to PERS and not actually directly to school. I think I heard a statistic, something like out of $1,000 more that's going to the education budget this year, 500 of that goes directly to PERS. That is a lot. And so, that's one of the things that needs to be addressed. You know, and th that is such a huge issue. Everyone is grappling with it. It's part of the Oregon business plan, which it was a plan put together with a whole lot of organizations um, to bring forth what, what they feel needs to happen in the state of Oregon to grow and prosper and to raise our income rates to match our neighbor in Washington. Um, but there's just a whole lot of issues around that. And PERS is probably the biggest one uh, that needs to be grappled with this legislative se session. Do you think it's going to be accomplished within this one legislative session? I have no crystal ball on that one. I mean, <laughs> even, even with all of the business organizations that I've been talking to and working with, they're not really sure. You know, it depends if the, um, if the political will is there, you know, to really take on reform. And I don't know yet. I really, really don't know. 
um, and that's the sense that I'm getting from the business organizations that are in the hub of the Oregon business plan and working with the legislators directly. You know, they're not sure either. But it really is what needs to happen in order for us to have a shift in the system. And have the increased graduation. Rates. Yeah, because it, it invests in, it, it will help us to reinvest back into the education system that's not all going to retirement. And not that I'm against that at all, because we all need to have our pensions and we all need to have our 401ks and what have you. And so, you know, just on the bigger picture, it just is the, the big but issue. It has to be balanced. Yes, and, and absolutely. And that's hopefully what, you know, yeah. will, will be the focus, is how to better balance for every, right. everybody and every... If there was one thing I had to watch, that would be the one thing is PERS reform and how that's going to happen and what is your, your legislature doing, and just in general. You know, and if that's important to you, education, you know, I would watch that closely because it all is tied together. Everything is tied together. Shirley. Um, what is your feeling about the um, economic outlook, business outlook for the state of Oregon? Does it seem like we're making progress, like that we're coming up out of the, the uh, recessions and so forth? It, are you hopeful or are you optimistic or is that a fair question? That's a fair question. Um, the economist that I have seen recently, um, I went to the Portland Business Alliance luncheon not too long ago or breakfast and they had an economist who presented and he said it's looking up. We have slow growth. It's slow but we have some growth. So, and just anecdotally, I can't speak to the whole state, but just my own experience through my organization. Um, one of my um, membership managers said to me that five companies that may, they met with in the last couple months said they had the best year they'd ever had in 2012. So when I hear things like that, to me that gives me a glimmer of hope that things are not perfect, certainly, but that there is slow growth and that people are starting to see some growth. I don't think we're over the bumps by any means, but I think there is some slow growth. And then there's just the big question of what's going to happen with the federal sequester, because that's just going to impact everybody and nobody really knows how right now. Can you tell us more about the charm program? Oh, sure, sure. Um, you actually can pick up a charm um, at the chamber office, and then we have this list of 100 businesses, and you can go around and get charms at the business. And this is, we so did this program. Oh, the charms themselves are like $2. Uh, the bracelet is 5 <laughs> um, It's been a really popular program. Um, it's been kind of fun. We're actually re-enrolling. Um, it'll happen in the next two months where we're re-enrolling. So some of these places may be out of their charms, but we still have quite a few at the office as well because home-based businesses can sell their charms at, at the chamber office as well. So they do, do they have the bracelet to start off with? We have the bracelet, so you come in and get the bracelet from us. So how so much are those? Those are $5. And that's actually really fun. We, we have these ladies who, I think for two months straight, came in every Monday morning to see what new charms we have um, because they were collecting them for their granddaughters and got a whole slew of them. Dog, dog house and a bone for the guide dogs. That's exactly, neat. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? We used to like to go to the governmental affairs mm -hmm. meetings. With the price up to $35, that's almost prohibitive for most people. Mm -hmm. I understand that. The, the price of $35 is for future members of the chamber. It's $20 for members. So, and that actually covers our costs. You know, really, it pays for our costs of lunch. And we've moved to Persimmon rather than Heidi's, but that covers our costs of doing the luncheon. So. But that's a lot for the yeah. community to come out. I can certainly understand that. But we also are we're a nonprofit organization that needs to run ourselves like a business. And so we take care of our operational things in the way that we need to uh, to come at the end of the year with a balanced budget as well. I, I think part of it is the increase when you go to the grocery store, the, the costs, the food costs in, in many ways have, have escalated. And partly because of transportation, partly because of the drought last summer, partly you know, the other other implications. And it's, I think it's a shock to everybody's budget. Um, and, and this is why business, well-run businesses and well-established business connections are so crucial mm -hmm. for the future planning Absolutely. of the community. Because if we don't have that coordinated effort, the cost of escalation mm -hmm. uh, in many factors, not just food. 
Right, and I think you bring up a good point. It's all interconnected. If gas goes up, the price for ranchers goes up, then beef prices go up, then milk prices go up. I mean, it, it's a chain reaction. Everything touches. There was an article in the Business Journal last week or the week before about beef prices and them going up. So, you know, you have to think about that. Ooh, okay, what pushed that? And those producers are concerned, you know, because it'll push it up everywhere. I have just one more question because I'm my husband and is this close to retirement? I mean, mm -hmm. this close, <laughs> and I'm right behind him. Um, so there, there, I'm I'm part of that beginning of that baby boomer generation, where it's a trickle now, to over ten thousand every day, mm -hmm. and it's soon going to become a flood. And then I've heard it called the silver tsunami. <laughs> 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 and we can laugh about this, but it, it, it's a reality. It is. How, how mm -hmm. well do you think the business sector, I'm thinking of nursing and, uh, and medical, how well do you think the entire um, business sector as a whole is prepared for this, which will, in a positive way, impact jobs, because my husband will be replaced mm -hmm. by a much younger person. So that's a positive, in a, in a sense that could help with the recession. Mm -hmm. how, how well prepared do you think they are, especially in those critical, I know nursing has been a shortage for some time. The one area um, in job growth that was happening um, in the forecast that uh, last year, not this past year, but the year before, the one year of growth was in healthcare um, because of the demand on those jobs. So I can't, I can't specifically answer your question, I think some, some sectors are prepared, some are not. Last year at our economic summit, a gentleman from Boeing spoke. I think by 2015, 50% of their workforce will be eligible for retirement. 2015? Yes. 50, 50, two and a half years away. Yes, 50% uh -huh. of their workforce will be eligible for retirement. And that is just one manufacturer, okay? So that's the type of thing that we're looking at, and that's why right now the focus on STEM science, technology, engineering, and math, and career technical education is so important. Because what's happening is there is a gap between the jobs that are available and the skills that are available. And every workforce conversation I have, that comes up at every level, whether it's at um, the local level, the state level. When I was at the Western Association of Chamber Executives Conference, a gentleman from the US Chamber spoke about that. You know, the gap. There is a huge gap, and it's something that needs to be addressed. And you know, with the state of our education, it's a, it's a really hard question. And so what it means is a lot of people and businesses are going to have to step up and help work on that workforce training and do a partnership with education. But there's no, there's no silver bullet here. There's no simple solution. So I would like to say, oh yeah, it's going to be great. Our unemployment levels will go down. But the thing is, there are jobs available right now. You could ask, this has happened two years in a row at our economic summit. We've asked people, do you have jobs available? And the answer has been yes. We cannot find the skilled workers to fill them. So I would like to say that people are prepared, but I, I, it's an issue. It's a problem. And it will continue to be so, and we're all going to have to come together, business organizations and education and government, to solve the problem. So with all the people out of work, they're just trained in other areas. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Some people are long-term unemployed and may not be the cream of the crop, uh, to put it that way, but some people, we just don't have the right skills match with what's needed out there. Um, the gentleman I was referring to at the U.S. Chamber had said that in every city that he goes to or every town in the country that has manufacturing, they don't have enough welders. There's not enough skilled welders. And so if you look backwards, part of why that has happened is many of the career training education programs that encourage kids to get hands-on experience with metalwork, they don't exist anymore because those programs have been cut. And so that's what happens. And now we're faced with this lack of skilled workforce in that particular area. It's great if you're a welder because you can go anywhere and work. But for manufacturers, they're hurting because they can't fill those positions. So, you know, this is a big, a big picture problem nationwide. It's not just our area or, you know, manufacturing in, in you know, the Portland metro area. It's, it's nationwide. Other questions? Yeah, that made me stop and think. I don't know if this pertains, but the, the programs at Mount Hood Community College how is the business, se the business sector in East County and 
and the chamber, how do they, or are they working and do they work and with, with the college? Mm -hmm. What is the connection there, or is there? There is, there's definitely. I think Mount Hood College has a really great uh, training program. Um, they do a lot of programs for business where they'll go in and create a specific training program for that business. And we are definitely aligned very closely with Mount Hood. One of their board members, one of their um, administrator is on my st is on my board, Mark Goldberg. And so we work very closely. We talk very often about workforce development. How do we do that? We sit on a couple of different committees together, so we're closely aligned. And they, they really do have an excellent training program. They also have those hands-on programs. They have a good automotive program. They have you know some of the shop programs, and I don't know the specific names of them, but they also work to tailor some of their programs to business so that students can come out with a certificate making them work ready. You know, so there has to be this partnership between business and education um, to make this happen. You know, it probably needs to be a lot more rigorous, but everyone's still trying to figure it out. You know, as the silver tsunami, as Kathy says, you know, comes through. <laughs> Other questions? Maybe Marlene could conclude, wrap it up. Well, uh, Allison, I I want to thank uh, Allison Hart for being here and uh, giving us an oversight of what is happening in Gresham and East County. And uh, I want to thank all of you for your questions and thank you for being here and to our audience for watching. Thank you so much. Thank you, Allison. Thank you.